We're going to take a break from our regularly scheduled program. Um, we're going to be um, taking one week off of Daniel. Last year, I started a series. I spent two weeks leading up to Valentine's Day talking about God's good plan for marriage. And I want to continue that. And the Sundays before Valentine's Day, just take time to talk about what God did when he made man and woman and joined them in holy matrimony. And part of the reason I want to do this is because our culture has declared war on marriage. They're trying to redefine the gender in that marriage. They're trying to redefine what God's Word has told us. And the best way to guard against that is to make sure that we properly represent that in our own homes. That's the first reason I want to talk about marriage. The second reason I want to talk about marriage is because God has designed marriage to adorn the gospel. He's, he's baked into the covenant relationship of man and wife a representation of what Christ did in rescuing his bride and in becoming one with her. We put that on display in our marriages. Thirdly, the oneness, the unity of the church declares the gospel to everybody who looks at us. And the unity of the church is tied together by the relationships in the church. We have joints and ligaments. You might remember last year we went through Ephesians 4 and we talked about that. Well, one of the most integral joints in that body is the marriage, where man and wife are joined together as one. The unity of the church is informed by the unity in our marriages. I heard a story this last week about a husband and wife who were on their way home from a marriage conference. And at the conference, the speaker had been talking about what a gift a wife is and what a blessing a woman is to her husband. And, and that's what the wife really noticed about this conference. So she turned to her husband on the way home and she said, honey, what, what are you thinking about me right now? And he said, you know, I've, I've been thinking just about how, how, how critical you are. And, and she started thinking in her head about all the, this lecture that she was going to give him about why she was not critical and he did not understand who she was and that she was just trying to help him and that he needed to accept her help. But then she realized if she said that, then she'd sort of be in checkmate. And so she thought about other things she'd heard at the conference. And instead of criticizing him, she said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, you're, you're critical to me. Like, I don't know passwords. I don't know how to pay our taxes. You do so many things for me. I don't know what I would do without you. You're critical to me. <laughs> Men and women mean different things when they say the same thing. Do you realize that? Now, a man looks in the closet and he says, honey, I have nothing to wear. A woman looks in the closet. She says, honey, I have nothing to wear. What do they mean? The man means I have nothing clean to wear. The woman means I have nothing new to wear. <laughs> Same phrase, different meaning. In marriage, God has taken two different people with different preferences, with different strengths, with different personalities, and he makes them into one. And what he's showing us is the unity of Christ and the church, two different things put together and made one. If you're sitting here and you're thinking today, oh, no, this sermon's not for me because I'm single, it's for you. Everybody eats. Why? Because you're a part of the church. And as part of the church, you need marriage to teach you what that means. What does it mean to be in union with Christ Jesus? This is, this is explained very clearly in Ephesians chapter 5. So that's where we're going to go today. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 22. It says this, wives... Submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the Savior of the body. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives are to submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. In the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it, just as Christ does for the church, 
since we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. To sum up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. Marriage is designed by God to incarnate the relationship of Christ and the church. Where do I get that from? Look at the passage here. Paul is quoting Genesis 2, verse 24, and verse 31. That's a direct quote from Genesis 2, 24, where he says, For this reason a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. But Paul puts it in a context where we can see why. You see, in Genesis 2, 24, we see what God did. God said, here's marriage, here's what's going to happen. A young man leaves his parents, and he is joined to his wife, and those two people become one person. But the reason that God did that is explained to us in Ephesians 5. Look at the immediate context. He says, for this reason. What's the reason? In the immediate context in Ephesians chapter 5, it's because we are joined to Christ, we are members of His body. Because we are joined to Christ and we are members of, of His body, God says a man needs to be joined to his wife. Here's what I want you to understand. Marriage wasn't the first thought. Marriage was the second thought. In other words, God didn't look down from heaven and say, what's something that I could use as a good illustration to show people what I mean when I say Christ and the church are going to be one? No, marriage was created by God in Genesis to show us his eternal intention for Christ and the church. Look, look at the verse that follows that. This mystery is profound. So if you're having trouble wrapping your brain around it, that's okay. Paul says this mystery is profound, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. This mystery, what mystery? Genesis 2, 24, verse 31 right there. This mystery is profound. It's talking about Christ and the church. Man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. There's all sorts of symbolism of, in Scripture that Christ is the bridegroom. And the church is his bride. You can hear that in Christ's parables. You can hear it in the way that, that Paul described the Corinthian church. He said, I, I'm jealous for you with godly jealousy because I want to present you as a chaste bride to Christ. He says, you are betrothed to one husband. The church right now is promised to God. We are his. Jesus is our bridegroom. And when we get to heaven and we get to spend eternity in the new heavens and the new earth with him, we have this huge celebration to start it all out. You remember what it's called? The marriage supper of the Galatian 19 adorned in white garments prepared for her husband. The two become one. But there's, there's symbolism even in the cross as Jesus is making a way for the two to become one. You remember Adam is put to sleep and his rib is taken from his side. Jesus has his side pierced and he goes into the grave for three days and he awakens. And what happens? The church is born. The two become one. Marriage is meant to incarnate the union of Christ and the church. What do I mean by incarnate? I mean it fleshes it out. This mystery that we as the church, anyone who has confessed Jesus as Lord and is joined to the body of the church is one with the head, with the bridegroom. We are one with Christ. Marriage is a living parable of that relationship. Marriage puts that on display so we can look at it and say, oh, that's what it means. That's what Christ and the church means. Because I have parents in my home and I can look at their marriage because I have parents and I have couples in my church and I can look at their marriage. I have godly couples in my neighborhood and I can look at their marriage and I learn about Christ and the church by observing their relationship. How's that work? How is it that the union in marriage puts on display the unity 
of Christ and the church. Well, that's what Ephesians 5 is showing us. He sums it all up in the last verse. Let me start there. Let me put the last verse on the screen. He says, to sum it up, each one of you is to love his wife as himself, and the wife is to respect her husband. That's, that's his summary. This is, this is how. What, what does it mean to put on display the unity of Christ and the church? He takes two. He makes one out of them. Because they're two, they're complements of each other. They're not the same as each other. And compliments have different needs, different desires, different ways they're going to experience love. And so what he shows us right here is that the way that a husband loves his wife is actually pretty straightforward. It's with love. Guys, we like to make things a little convoluted. If you want to make a guy feel love, you know what you do? You show him respect. Respect is the language through which men hear love. If a guy if a guy feels respected, he feels loved. Here's our problem. We're two different people. And so I'm going to communicate love the way I hear love. I hear love through respect. So I'm going to communicate respect to my wife, just like I would with one of my bros. It doesn't work. She needs me to communicate love to her in a way that she understands it and vice versa. See, this is, this is how we put on display that two people have become one in Christ. We have different desires. We have different needs for how we're going to communicate that love. Love and respect is the what. Sacrifice and submission are the how. How do you show respect? By submission. How do you demonstrate love? By sacrifice. That's what we see in this passage here. I was reading a survey recently. They surveyed 7,000 couples 7,000 couples, they asked them this question, when you're in a conflict with each other, do you feel A, unloved, or B, disrespected? 83% of the men said, I feel disrespected in a conflict. 71% of the women said, I feel unloved in a conflict. God sort of baked this into who we are as male and female. We need to feel, men need to feel respected in order to believe that they're actually loved. Women need to experience love. They need to feel cherished in order to know that they are loved. Now, what's interesting about this is our culture attacks only one of those. It doesn't really play fair. Men loving their wives, our culture is fine with that. Yep, that's great. Guys, you need to do that. You need to love your wife, and you need to love her unconditionally. But wives respecting their husbands, mm -mm. you don't do that. You make that bozo earn it. You make him earn it, and then you show him respect. Now, now that's a double standard. What do I mean? Because with love, we don't have that standard. If a husband said, I'll love my wife when she's earned it, we're going to say, you jerk. You need to go to marriage counseling. Go talk to Pastor Caleb. But if a, a woman says, I'll respect my husband when he's earned it, you go, girl. You do you. That's what our society says. That's what our culture says. But both of them, you need to understand, are how we communicate love, and both of them are to be unconditional. Why? Because if they're not unconditional, we're preaching a gospel that's salvation by works. You're loved, you're respected when you have earned it. Is that how Christ treats you? You have to earn it from him. It's unconditional, the favor, the love, the affection that he gives you. He gives you without standards. He pours it out on you abundantly. But I want to show you, because, because our culture sort of attacks respect, I want to show you the why for respect, because it's explained really clearly in 1 Peter chapter 3. Why is it so important that a wife respects her husband unconditionally? So we can see it in 1 Peter 3, 1 and 2. And I'm going to put it in the ESV because it's a little bit more clear here. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. You see that word respectful right there? Same word as Ephesians 5:33. When a husband sees your respectful conduct, you know what happens? He's won over to the gospel by your respectful conduct. 
Now, what this is talking about, this is talking about a man who doesn't even obey the word. This is saying, this is how a man's heart is wooed towards the gospel. It's through the respect, the unconditional respect his wife shows him. This is the language that men hear love through. Now, I don't, I need to explain this at the very beginning. One of the reasons that I want to go through marriage annually is because I need to. Because I'm married. And I need to hear this. I'm preaching this to myself. I don't have this all figured out. Something that's actually been really helpful to me is actually sitting down with other couples and giving them counsel. Because when we sit down with other couples and give them counsel, you know what happens? The Spirit points a finger back at me and says, what about you, Pastor Caleb? How are you doing with that? Because it's one thing to know what you're supposed to do, right? But then it's another thing to do it. When I'm Doing marriage counseling, this is, this is what I often hear from women when I explain unconditional respect to them. They say, but I'll feel like such a hypocrite. I'll feel like such a hypocrite if I show respect to my husband when I don't actually feel respect for him. And there's three answers I have for women who say that. The first answer is it's not about feelings. One of the lies that we believe in our culture is that marriage is built on a firm foundation of feelings. No. That's why people fall in and out of love, because your feelings, they ebb and they flow. Marriage is built on a firm foundation of the truth of God's Word. That's what's unshakable. And what's His Word say? Respect. It doesn't say, make sure you have these butterflies and these feelings of respect and admiration all the time. Don't build a marriage on the sand of feeling, because it's going to shift. You build it on the reality of God's Word. Secondly, what you're respecting first is the position. You're respecting the position. God created a hierarchy. God created an order. God put my husband over me. If you want to know if you have a husband over you, you just look at your marriage license. Then you know, okay, that's what God did. That's the man I need to show respect to. You respect the position. Jesus says this about the scribes and the Pharisees. He said, you respect them because they sit in the seat of Moses, but you don't do what they do. You can show respect when somebody's character is not in line with the standard of God's word because you're respecting the position. What's interesting right now is men, as I'm saying this, they're nodding. They're like, yep, I get that. Because they know how to operate in a system of hierarchy where they have a boss who they don't respect his character, but he's my boss, so I'm going to do what he says. Or a military structure, you can have a commander who you don't, you don't really respect his character, but you respect his position. If you're doing our Bible reading with us, we're in 1 Samuel right now. David shows what it looks like to have unconditional respect for a person. Are you with me? Saul, twice... God gives David an opportunity to kill Saul, and he doesn't do it. Why? He's the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to lift my hand against him. He's respecting the position. Third thing I want to tell you about respect is shine apples. Shine apples. What do I mean by shine apples? Find something you can respect about that guy and talk to him about that. Whatever it is. He has, a, he has a hobby he's consistent about. Tell him, I think that, that's awesome, that skill that you have. He goes to work every single day. Thank him for that. Well, one of the things that we do sometimes as men and women, we assume that our spouse is a mind reader. I, I, I don't know if it's more for introverts, but all the time I think, well, of course my wife knows that I love her. I don't actually need to tell her I love you like I told her last week. Did I need to tell her that? Yes, I do. And sometimes I forget, did I just think that or did I actually say that? And whenever I do that, I just, well, I should just say that, that she looks lovely today. That people want to hear it. I, I heard it illustrated this way. Would you, if you're hungry, would you rather look at a picture of a hamburger or would you want to eat the hamburger? You want to eat the hamburger. So knowing that your wife respects you is one thing, but hearing it is eating the hamburger. That satisfies. Knowing that your husband loves you is one thing, but hearing that he loves you is quite another. You want to eat the hamburger. You want to communicate those things to each other. In, in a marriage relationship, almost every single conflict comes because of a lack of love or a lack of respect. 
And what can happen in a marriage relationship is when a husband feels disrespected, sometimes he acts in an unloving way. And a wife, you know what happens when she feels that she's not being loved? She can act in a disrespectful way. And you know what the husband does when he feels disrespected? He acts in an unloving way. And you get on this crazy train. Do you know how to get off of that? Forgiveness. Forgiveness. Whatever the offense is, you forgive it. You let it go. You go to that balance, that tally that you're keeping in your head, and you say, wait a second, love doesn't keep track of wrongs that are suffered. I love my spouse. I'm going to zero out the account in my head of what they owe me because they did A, B, C, or D. I'm going to zero that out. I'm going to let go of that. Here's a basic rule of thumb. Show just as much mercy to your spouse as you want Jesus to have for you. Okay? There's your standard. Show just as much mercy to your spouse as you want Jesus to have for you. If you have children in your home, you're teaching them about Jesus' mercy by the way you treat your spouse, by the way you let go of an offense, by the way you ignore an offense. Men, that's honorable, it says in Proverbs, to ignore an offense. God has designed men and women to hear love through the language of love and respect. He takes two people, different preferences, different identities, and he puts them together and he makes one out of them. Marriage is meant to incarnate the union of Christ and the church. Now, what I want to do is I want to go back through the passage and look specifically at what it says the wife is supposed to do and what it says the husband is supposed to do. So it tells us this. It says, the submission of the wife incarnates the lordship of Christ. When a wife submits because she respects her husband, she's telling the world, Jesus is Lord. Do you see the connection? You see, your marriage reflects the union of Christ and the church. Jesus is Lord. He's our Lord. He's the Lord of our church. That's our confession. That's our salvific confession. If we don't confess that, we're not saved. That's how you identify a believer. There's somebody who says, Jesus is my Lord. He's king of my life. He's master of everything I do. I'm going to submit to him. What's that look like? God says, well, I'm going to let this wife right here show you what it looks like. In her life, she's going to demonstrate for all the world what it looks like to submit to a man so the world will understand what it means when a Christian says, Jesus is Lord. A woman's submission to her husband is either preaching lies or truths about the gospel. A a woman who refuses to follow her husband is saying a lie. She's saying, you can confess Jesus as Lord and not follow him. A woman who refuses to allow her husband to have any authority in the home is preaching a lie. She's saying, you can say Jesus is Lord, but you don't need to take that lordship home with you. You don't need to actually obey him. You just say it. You don't need to actually do it. A woman who submits to her earthly husband without fear is demonstrating that she believes God is on the throne at all times. What do I mean? The reason that a woman can submit to her husband without fear is she can say, God's word says this is the structure that I'm supposed to do. And so because I believe that God is in control, I'm willing to submit to my husband and adorn the gospel and put on display what it means to follow the Lord. Look at the passage. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. You see that? As to the Lord. What does it mean as to the Lord? It doesn't mean that your husband is a perfect reflection of the Lord. Far from it. And you're the person who can see it most clearly. You see his failures. You see his foibles. You see his problems. You see his hypocrisy. You see all of that better than anybody else in the world does. It's not because he's respectable that you respect him. It's because Jesus is Lord that you respect him. And if Jesus is Lord, then you can look at the structure that he's created in marriage with a husband as a head and the wife as his body. And you can say, I'm going to honor that because I know whom I have believed in, because I know who's reigning on high. And I'm going to demonstrate my confidence in his lordship by submitting to my husband. I don't don't know if you've ever um, 
watched people who actually know how to swing dance, swing dance, but it's pretty awesome to see. Uh, my, my kids, some of my kids, they, they enjoy swing dancing, and some of them are getting pretty good at it, but when I watch people who can actually do it, what, what I love about it is that it reflects what this is talking about. It reflects headship and following, because people who are actually good at it, the man is leading, but you really have to pay attention to realize he's leading because it's simply a, a, a simple shift of his hand or a change with his feet. But his partner, the woman, she's paying attention to those things. She's cueing into that, and she's following him. That's what headship looks like. It looks like the man leading, the woman following. I think that one of the reasons that our culture hates this teaching our culture hates it. You go out there, I share this on the street, I'm going to get rotten tomatoes thrown at me. Why is that? It's because they don't know what we mean when we say submission. So I want to tell you a few things that submission is not, because one of the dangers is that we can go to an extreme and we take it to something it was never meant to be. You see, this was written to a Roman culture. This was written to a patriarchal culture. This was written to a culture where men were the head of the household. So why did Paul need to write it? Why did he tell, need to tell women to submit to their husbands? Well, he needed to tell them to submit because you respect. You're not submitting and you're miserable and you're just going to do it. You're going to submit to your husband because you respect him. And that submission looks like co-heirs. It looks like equals in Christ. It's a submission of two who are equal in value, in worth, in eternal reward in Christ Jesus. It's not one that is greater and one is lesser. It's a submission of equals. This is countercultural. So, so first thing I want to tell you is what submission is not. First thing submission is not. Submission does not abdicate the role of helper in the relationship. Do you remember what God said when he made Eve? He said he made her a helper complementary to him. He made her a helper suitable to him. You don't abdicate your role as helper when you submit to your husband. What am I talking about? If you see something, say something. So, sometimes women can think, okay, submission means I never share my point of view. I never share my perspective. I never share my insight. And you know what they're doing? They're abdicating their role as a helper for their husband. God has given you a unique perspective. Your husband needs that. He needs to hear from you. He needs your insight. He needs to see what you see. You have sensitivity to things that he's not going to have sensitivity to. He needs to hear that from you. He needs to get that from you. He needs to hear that so that he can have a fuller perspective. God's put you together to help each other. So submission does not mean abdicating your role as helper. Secondly, submission does not make a woman helpless. Does not make a woman helpless. Think about this. In Mark chapter 7, there's a story of the Syrophoenician woman. Jesus goes up to Tyre. He goes away with his disciples. He goes away because he's trying to take them on a retreat to prepare them for his imminent death. He's going to be dying soon. And so he goes away to Tyre because it's all Gentiles who live there. And as he's walking through the streets, this woman comes to him and she begins to beg him, Lord, rescue my daughter, cast the demon out of my daughter. And at first Jesus ignores her and she keeps on pestering Jesus. The disciples are like, Jesus, can you do something about this? And he turns to her and he says, I have not come except to the lost sheep of Israel. <laughs> and she keeps on asking him. She says, Lord, please, my daughter, cast the demon out of her. And Jesus looks at her and he says, it's not good to give the children's bread to the dogs under the table. Sort of insulting, he's calling her a dog. You know what she does? She says, yes, Lord, but even the dogs get the crumbs that fall from the table. You know what Jesus does? He looks at her. And in Matthew tells us this. He says, woman, great is your faith. Your daughter's healed. Jesus doesn't say, why are you not submitting to me? I said I wasn't going to do this. I didn't come for you. You're a Gentile. That's not, why, that's not what he does. He's willing to yield. Who's, who's the ultimate head? Who's the ultimate authority? Jesus is. That's what headship looks like. Look at Jesus. Look how he interacts with the Syrophoenician woman. Look how he interacts with his mother. 
at the wedding at Cana. He's willing to yield. Submission does not make a woman helpless. She has something to contribute. Third, submission is not the end of autonomy. Submission is not the end of autonomy. It doesn't mean, okay, you submit to your husband, so that means you just sort of sit at home and wait for your marching orders. Whatever he tells you to do, you do. If he doesn't give you something to do, you don't know what you're supposed to do. You're an automaton now. You're programmed. That's not how it works. Think about this. Think about the ideal woman in Scripture. Ideal woman in Scripture, Proverbs 31. Think about how many things it says that she does are independent, are autonomous. Let me point this out to you. Proverbs 31, 16. She evaluates a field and buys it. She plants a vineyard with her earnings. Verse 18. She sees that her profits are good and her lamp never goes out at night. Submission is not the end of autonomy. Submission means, well, let me give you a definition for submission. It's supporting the husband's authority to make decisions for the household. You're supporting that. You're saying, my heart is to defer to you. Do you want want to lead in this area? What should we do in this area? I want to hear from you. I want to follow you. But that doesn't mean I'm incapable of action if you don't give me direction. And it also means when I hear from you that you think we should go a certain way, and I don't think you have all the information. I don't think you have a full perspective. I'm going to share that with you. But my heart is to defer to you. Husbands and wives, understand this rule applies to both of you. Outdo one another in showing honor, in showing respect. That's the goal. God has uniquely situated marriages within the church to teach us what submission looks like. Your children in your home learn about submission by the gender roles in the marriage. By the way, the wife submits to the husband. Children learn how they're supposed to submit to their parents. The people in the church that surround you learn how they're supposed to submit to leadership by husband and wife. We teach the watching world what submission looks like. We teach them the beauty of submission with the roles God has given us in marriage. Marriage is meant to incarnate the union of Christ and the church. The submission of the wife incarnates the lordship of Christ. And then secondly, the sacrifice of the husband incarnates the love of Christ. Husbands, I want you to get this. We need to understand this. Our love for our wife and the way we express it is either preaching truth or lies about the love Christ has for the church. What's your love for your wife preaching about Christ today? If you're only willing to be loving to your wife when she does what you want, you are teaching with your life a merit-based salvation. You're teaching with your life conditional love. I will love her when I feel like it. A husband who loves unconditionally is presenting the beautiful agape love that Christ has for his bride. And the way that a husband does that is by sacrificing himself laying down his wants, his desires, his dreams, his aspirations for the sake of his wife. Look at the passage. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her to make her holy, cleansing her with the washing of water by the word. He did this to present the church to himself in splendor without spot or wrinkle or anything like that, but holy and blameless. I don't have much time to go through this passage, so husbands, I'm going to give you a really quick outline of this passage. There's a past, present, and future aspect of the love that Christ has for the church, and you're responsible to reflect all three of those. Past. Look at the passage there. What has Christ done? Past tense. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church, and he gave himself for her. What's that talking about? Jesus died for his bride. Jesus went to the cross for his bride. And husbands, you did too. You know when? At the altar. When you made your vows. You died that day. Did you know that? When you committed that you were going to love her, what you were saying is, I'm going to die to self. That's what love looks like. You can't love self and love her. You got to die to self. You were making a lifelong commitment. I'm dying to myself so I can love you well. 
It's no longer just me out here living as a bachelor on my own, doing my thing for me to make me happy. No, I'm dying to that. That life is dead. That person is dead. And I wake up, and the two are one. And now I'm living for her. Her wants, her desires. I'm going to lay mine down for her. I'm going to die to self for her. That's what it means to lay your life down. And here's the deal. You did that on the day that you swore to be her husband, on the day you said, I do. But you also need to continue to do it every single day. I love to ask men this when I'm doing marriage counseling. I ask them, would you take a bullet for your wife? I have yet to have a guy tell me no. And I don't care like how messed up their marriage is. Every guy is like, yeah, I'd take a bullet for her. Like, men, we know that. And just so you ladies know here, like, Basically, from the time you're five years old and on, you envision that in your head. Like, if terrorists come in here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump in front of a bullet, right? That's what guys, like, they, they fantasize about that. Girls, they're fantasizing about their, their wedding someday. Guys are like, I'm going to take a bullet. I'm going get married, so I'm going to take a bullet, right? That's what they think about. But then I, I turn the question around, and I ask the guy, say this. Okay, you, you take a bullet for your wife. What about an insult from your wife? Whoa. <laughs> hey, pastor. <laughs> what a... Be careful there. You know, that's dangerous stuff you're talking about. I mean, a bullet just, it could kill you. It could maim you horribly. But an insult? I don't know about that. You see, one of the responsibilities you have as men is to draw near to your wife when you feel like she's pushing you away with her words. Sacrifice. Lay down your life. And a lot of the reason we feel pushed away is because we don't speak her language. So let me help you out, guys, a little bit. Let me in- interpret a little bit for you. When, when a wife is criticizing you, a guy hears, you don't respect me, you're criticizing me, you don't want to have anything to do with me, I'm just going to leave. What a wife is saying when she criticizes you, she's saying, I want to connect with you. I'm trying to connect with you. She wants you to draw near to her and you feel pushed away from her. Why? Because you're not the same person. But Christ has made you one. And so what you need to do is you need to draw near. You guys think of it this way. This is how I fantasize about it. Think of it like you're taking fire and you're going to move towards enemy fire, okay? That's what's happening. You're going to move right in towards enemy fire. She's saying these things that are criticizing me. Here's something else. This is something that I struggle with. Sometimes when my wife asks me a question, she's trying to connect. She's asking me a question because she wants to connect. But I think she's questioning my authority. That's what guys hear, okay? We're weird. That's what we hear. And so I have to remind myself, she's not questioning my authority. She's asking me a question because she wants to understand. She wants to get it. She wants to walk through. She wants to get inside my head and walk through my thoughts with me. That's what they want to do. Why? Because that results in intimacy. That's really hard for introverts to do, right? Okay, I'm going to try to let you in, but I don't even know how to get in there sometimes. She's not asking me a question because she's questioning me. She's asking me a question because she wants to connect with me. Husbands, you have died to yourself. You made a commitment to that. Past, present. Presently, you have a responsibility towards your wife. Christ is washing his bride with the water of the word. And husbands, you have a responsibility to do the same. What does that look like? It doesn't look like this. It doesn't look like bludgeoning her with the word. It looks like calling to life what's spiritual inside of her with the word of God. In other words, it's not, you need to be like my ideal woman that I see in scripture right here. It's, this is what God's word says about you. This is who you are in Christ. It's totally different. It's not an accusation. It's a reminder. It's not you need to be better. It's you already are this person in Christ. And I just want to remind you of that. It's washing her with the water of the word. Future. Christ has a future day in mind. He has that marriage supper of the Lamb in mind. And on that day, he's going to present his bride to himself without splendor. You have a role to play in your wife's sanctification. And as husbands, your goal is that one day they're going to be able to stand before their Lord in splendor because they were married to you, because of how you invested in them, because of how you called to life what was spiritual inside of them, because of how you, because of how you saw their spiritual gifts and encouraged them to use them in the community of saints. They're going to be more splendid in that day because they were married to you. That's your future goal. 
That's what you're shooting for in your relationship with your wife. The passage ends here. He says this, in the same way, husbands are to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself, for no one ever hates his own flesh, but provides and cares for it just as Christ does for the church, since we are members of his body. Husbands, you need to get this. I've I've heard the illustration in marriage that that a, a firefighter would never leave his partner behind, a police officer would never leave his partner behind, and so you can't leave your partner behind. It doesn't go far enough. It doesn't say she's your partner. What's it say? She's your body. You wouldn't leave your body behind. You're in a burning house. Your arm catches on fire. What do you do? Sorry, arm. I'm out of here. Sucks to be you. No, what do you do? You put it out. You put the fire out on your arm and you get out of there. And guess what you do? You take arm with you because arm is you. Do you understand that? Your wife is you. If If your wife has some sort of unhealth in her life, that's yours. If she has spiritual immaturity, that's yours. If she has a struggle, that's yours. She is you. Don't divide it in your head. She's you. You are her. The two are one. It's not you don't leave your partner behind. It's you don't leave your body behind. What are you supposed to do? Look at the words that are used here. You're supposed to provide and care for your wife. Those words literally mean tender and loving care for the sake of growth. It's actually usually used to refer to how a mother feeds their child so their child will grow. And Paul uses it right here to describe husbands. Are you nurturing your wife? Are you cherishing your wife? Are you tender in your love towards her? You know, guys hear that like, well, you know, sort of a macho man. I don't really, I'm not into all that romance stuff. In Christ you are. In Christ, you have his bridegroom love. And you're able, in your own way, you don't need to become another person, you're able in your own way to express that you love and you cherish your wife. Husbands, let me remind you what you have. 2 Timothy 1.7 says this, For God has not given us a spirit of fear. You can feel like, how can I do this? It's easy to give in to that fear. That's not who you are. You have a spirit of power. In other words, you have the power to do this. And you have the love to do this. Why? Romans 5, 5. The love of God is shed abroad in your heart through the Holy Spirit who's given to you. The bridegroom love of Christ that he has for you as his bride is in your heart so you can manifest it to your bride. You're a channel. You're a channel of his love. You're putting it on display so the world can see what kind of self-sacrificial love Christ has for his bride. What Christ did for his church is manifest in the love that you have for your wife. You know, a a good marriage doesn't happen because there's two people whose personalities are so complementary, there's no friction. That doesn't happen. Usually opposites attract because that's how compliments work. She has what you don't. You have what she doesn't. And when two opposite people live in one household together, there's going to be conflict. So a good marriage isn't made of two people who have perfect personalities that just jive perfectly. A good marriage is made of two people who forgive well. That's it. That's the recipe. Good marriage, you're a great forgiver. But one of the problems is a lot of people don't understand how forgiveness works. Forgiveness is a symphony with two parts. The first part of that symphony happens quietly, silently in your own heart. The second part is when your spouse actually comes to you and they verbalize that they're sorry and you speak it out. But that first part happens when you realize, I'm offended, I've been hurt, but love does not keep a record of wrong suffered. That's not what love does. And so what I need to do is I need to go into the ledger in my head where I've written a balance that they owe me because of what they did to me, and I need to zero that out. How can you do that? Because of what Christ did for you. If he's forgiven you an infinite offense, you can forgive every finite offense. And that's why we're going to end our services today with communion. Because that love is what compels us. It says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 14, for the love of Christ compels us since we have reached this conclusion, if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all, so those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was 
raised. Christ died, but you know what? He's not the only one. I died with him. And now I live, not for myself. I live for him. The way that you live for him is that when you're offended, you don't hold on to it. Because he didn't hold on to it. You show the same mercy to your spouse that you accept to receive from Christ. You're only enabled to do that because he has forgiven you much. The one who's forgiven much, what do they do? They love much. And so husband, if you're struggling to love your wife today, look at the cross and meditate on this reality. Christ was broken for you. That's what we remember in the bread. In 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, Christ, when he had given thanks, broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Do you understand what it means that Christ's body was broken for you? It means that he stepped into your place. He took all of your offense and he took all of your punishment for you. And you have a responsibility in your home to show your family what that looks like and the way that you self-sacrificially love your wife. As you lay down your life, you're showing that a life was laid down for you that has radically changed you from the inside out. 